Hi, my name is Joel Nider. I'm from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. My co-author and advisor is Sasha Fedorova. Let me tell you a story about CPUs. In the beginning, CPUs were designed for a single purpose, performing logical operations on stored memory. They were very simple. As functionality was added, coprocessors were also added, such as IO channel processors, interrupt controllers, floating point processors, because they could perform certain specialized tasks faster and more efficiently than the main CPU. They enhanced the system performance by allowing the CPU to focus on application logic and general system functions, while the simpler coprocessors handled the more mundane tasks. CPUs are very popular for applications because they can perform a wide range of tasks fairly well. They are good, but not great, at almost everything. And that was fine while we could rely on a yearly increase in performance from CPUs, but those days are over. Applications are still demanding more compute resources, but more powerful CPUs are no longer able to meet that demand alone. Accelerators were introduced to help fill that gap. Accelerators, such as SSDs, GPUs, and FPGAs, have already taken over the main processing tasks for many high-performance applications, such as image recognition, computer vision, big data, deep learning, and many more. Accelerators are commonly used to reduce overall system cost and increase performance orders of magnitude beyond the capabilities of a general-purpose CPU. In fact, it is becoming common to offload entire applications to powerful accelerators, such that the CPU is really only needed for initial setup and error handling. We believe breaking dependence on the CPU will allow us to design systems that are more efficient and scalable. There are several reasons to remove CPUs from the system. The main one is efficiency. Many CPUs are just far too powerful and expensive once the critical processing tasks have been offloaded to other hardware. CPUs are expensive to buy, but also expensive to operate. They often get in the way on the critical data path, which is why so much research has been done to avoid them and the kernels that run on them. All but also from a security perspective, designing a secure high-performance CPU is a difficult task. And as we've seen with the recent wave of vulnerabilities that have been discovered, such as Meltdown, Spectre, all the MDS attacks, the scope of responsibility of the CPU just makes it impractical to verify it completely with all of its possible interactions. But we don't need a very powerful CPU because the control tasks that are needed to set up these accelerators can be boiled down to simple operations that can be handled in simple hardware with the cooperation of the other accelerators and devices in the system. So that's about the hardware. But what does it mean for the operating system that runs on the CPU? Well, operating systems provide three key functions. Virtualization, which includes multiplexing and address translation, isolation, and resource management. These functions must shift from the centralized OS kernel to a decentralized model that consists of self-managing hardware. So basically, we're asking the question, can we use the hardware resources of a single machine without relying on a CPU for setup and coordination? Well, for that to happen, we need two things. One, devices must be self-managed. A self-managing device must manage its own internal state. It must expose the services that it provides and provide a separate context for each instance of the service, which prevents data leakage between the instances and provides isolation. They must also be able to manage their own resources on behalf of devices in the system and expose them in a standardized way. The second thing that has to happen is that devices must be able to communicate autonomously. A device must be able to discover services that it needs and request them directly from the owner. A device must be able to advertise its services and decide who can use those services. So smart devices are able to offer a much richer set of services that can replace many APIs traditionally offered by the operating system on a CPU. By raising the level of abstraction, we can write simpler application logic. Now we just need a bus. Not that one. We require 
two different functions from our interconnects. One is memory access. Uh, you can see that in the blue bus at the bottom, which can be thought of as the data plane. And we need a separate function, which is device configuration, uh, which is the pink bar at the top. And you can view that as the control plane. We believe that these functions should be separate from a system design and performance perspective. In current systems, the CPU is responsible for setting up address spaces during initialization. Since we can no longer rely on the CPU, there must be an independent method of addressing devices before virtual address spaces are set up. So unlike other decentralized systems like Lego OS or Barrelfish, no entity sees the entire system and there is no global state replication. The bus enables devices to communicate their resource needs in a standard way on demand and enables the devices to broadcast their capabilities so that other devices can discover and use them. This is accomplished by sending messages to one another on the bus and to request services such as allocation of memory or opening a file. The system bus operates as a privileged device and is the mechanism for maintaining virtualization. There are many more details about what we need from the system bus uh, and from the devices that are supposed to interact with the bus. As the only privileged entity, it is important to note that the system bus contains the mechanism, but not the policy for memory management. It does not make decisions about resource allocation, load balancing, or anything else. These are all left up to the accelerators that are running the application logic. This is the key to scalability and to better isolation. So this seems a bit far-fetched in some ways. So we have to ask, how far are we away from reality? Well, there are many questions that remain to be answered, such as access control, error handling, system maintenance, and programmability. Our next step is to evaluate the effort required to integrate a hardware device uh, such as Mellanox Bluefield, which is a self-managing device uh, that can expose the Vertio protocol, how we can uh, integrate that into a system that has an emulated bus. So in conclusion, we can see that demand for higher performance computing is pushing system design towards more specialized hardware. In this uh, presentation, in this paper, we've taken an extreme position to completely remove the CPU from the system as a thought experiment. Such a drastic change forced us, and hopefully you, to think about system design in a new way and the impact it will have on how we manage such a system for our applications. We, of course, realize that not all systems require accelerators, and some problems are just easier to solve on a CPU. So now we have a new question to ask. What would it look like if we brought back the CPU and reintroduced it into such a system? Would it fundamentally change how software is written on the CPU? So we must all consider how such changes will impact system design and what shape operating systems will take in a completely decentralized system. Thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to answer any questions.